Did you know that in Christ you have an indestructible life? That's fantastic news all the time, but it's especially encouraging when life gets hard or feels uncertain. Don't give up. Satan can't have you, the world can't overcome you, and the challenges you face can't stop you. In Christ, you're indestructible. If you're a woman who desires to learn more about God and yourself through the lives of people in the Bible, you'll find all that and more right here. This is the Indestructible Life Podcast, and I'm your host, Emily Wickham. Hello and welcome to Episode 2 of The Indestructible Life. I hope each of you are doing well and that you're excited about today's study. I have a question first. Do you remember how in Episode 1 I described my office to you and just the lovely surroundings and how it was full of windows and light and just how it's a sanctuary to me? Well, I have to tell you, I'm not recording this episode in my beautiful office. I am recording in my closet. (laughs) And my closet is small. It certainly doesn't have any windows. And it's not exactly what you would call lovely. But here is the vital part of why this closet is special. It's quiet. And that's what I needed today. I needed to find a quiet place. So I'm treasuring this space and I feel grateful for it. And it's interesting because it serves as a small illustration for today's story because it demonstrates how we cannot always have things the way we want. You know, I would rather record in my office, but my closet is the place God has provided today. So it's good. And speaking of today's story, I just want to preface that by sharing, I seem to have a knack for choosing difficult Bible passages. For example, when I decided to write a Bible study on the book of Esther, I did not realize there was some disagreement about that Old Testament book in the Bible. And I won't get into those details, but needless to say, the passage God has led me to talk about here in episode two contains an aspect that's hard to form a clear understanding of. And as I studied and and noticed this particular aspect, I sort of got hung up on it. Like I have just spent probably hours thinking about it and I've prayed about it and I have finally reached the place where I have to be okay with not knowing exactly what took place. So I'm just going to present the opinion I'm leaning toward at this point and you can study God's word and consider that same aspect I'm referring to And you can consider it with the Holy Spirit's help and just see where he takes you on it. Before we go any further, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the gift of your word and the privilege we have to learn from your very words. Please teach us now by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I hope I have piqued your interest in the person we are going to study from God's Word. We are going to take a look at the life, or at least a portion, of the life of Leah. So please listen as I read Genesis 29, verses 16 through 25. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak. But Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. For my time is completed, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came about in the evening, 
that he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob went in to her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? Wow, what a way to start a marriage. This is not the stuff dreams are made of, and I find this situation so very sad. But it's real, and as you know, real life can be very, very sad and heartbreaking at times. So let me just recap what we read. Jacob loved Rachel and thought he was marrying her, only to discover he had married Leah instead. Her father Laban had deceived Jacob into marrying her since she was the older sister. And this was an absolute disappointment to Jacob. He had his heart set on Rachel, and he worked for seven years so he could marry her. But Jacob was deceived into marrying the wrong woman. And I cannot help but think about how Jacob had deceived his elderly father, and he received the blessing that his older brother Esau should have received. And it was by deception. So deception, as you keep reading about this family in scripture, deception is a thread that seems to weave itself through. And it really causes tremendous problems and heartache. Uh, So here, um, Jacob is not the deceiver. He is the one who was deceived and man, (laughs) this was a really bad discovery for him when he realized he married the wrong woman. And he confronted Laban about the situation. And he was Jacob was able to marry Rachel after he finished his wedding week with Leah. And then he had to work another seven years for Laban as payment for Rachel. But what I want us to focus on now is verse 31, because this is the verse that really got my attention and revealed the aspect of this story that I have been struggling to understand. Verse 31 in the New American Standard Bible says Leah was unloved, but the King James Version puts it differently. It reads, and when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So, it doesn't just say Leah was unloved. Leah was hated. What an intense description. To me, unloved carries the connotation of being overlooked or neglected or just not cared about. And that is horrible enough. But on the other hand, in my opinion, being hated is a lot more intentional. So I've just really been trying to grasp the meaning here. And I looked up the Hebrew word, which is sane, and that's the Hebrew word used in verse 31. And it literally means to hate or be hated. So you would think, well, okay, that settles it. But here's another part of this. Evidently, that same Hebrew word holds a wide spectrum of meaning. And the lexical aids in my keyword study Bible state, and I quote, this Hebrew verb is used 145 times in the Old Testament, ranging from intense hatred to simple opposition of persons or things. And in reference to Genesis 29, 31, The same lexical aids also say this word means preference and expresses the ill will and aversion between a husband and a wife, end quote. Now here's another statement that adds insight. It comes from BibleRef.com, and I quote, Jacob accepted the marriage, but unsurprisingly did not feel the same love for Leah, which he carried for Rachel. 
Jacob loved Rachel enough to work seven years for her. Finding Leah in his marriage bed was a cruel surprise. The previous verse tells us flatly that he loved Rachel more than Leah. This verse goes further. Leah was hated. This is a common feature of ancient literature, which often used exaggerated contrasts in order to show a difference from one side to another. Jacob's love for Rachel, combined with his resentful indifference to Leah, meant she was hated, at least by comparison. Then again, in this particular case, Jacob's experience might well have caused him to hate Leah literally. End quote. So even though we don't know exactly what Jacob's feelings were toward Leah, I think it's safe to gather that compared to his love for Rachel, he hated Leah. Isn't that awful? I cannot imagine the excruciating pain Leah must have experienced day after day. And in addition to Jacob's hatred, I think it's possible Rachel hated Leah too. Leah had to have known Jacob loved Rachel deeply. So I can't help but wonder, why didn't Leah reveal her identity to Jacob on their wedding night? But then again, maybe she did tell Jacob who she was, but he didn't comprehend it if he had had too much to drink at the wedding festivities. As you can see, there is a lot we don't know about this situation, but some details are crystal clear. For instance, it's very clear Leah was not the woman Jacob desired to marry. And scripture also states Leah was hated. Though we don't know the extent of this hatred, we can all agree it was a lonely, miserable place for Leah. And This hatred reminds me of how Jesus was rejected and hated by the religious leaders of his day. He was not the Messiah they desired. They wanted someone who would come in and set up an earthly kingdom. But that wasn't Jesus' mission at the time. Jesus fully understands what it feels like to be hated. In fact, he was hated to the point of death. Yet, Jesus gave his life willingly to pay for our sins. He forgave those who nailed him to the cross, even while he was still hanging and suffering on it. And that, my friends, is true love. Listen to Romans 5, 8. It says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to stop here and just emphasize, if you do not have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, please just stop everything right now and take care of this. It's the most important decision you will ever make. It's, it's important for all eternity. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need Jesus. We cannot have a relationship with God without Jesus. He died to pay for our sins. And you can receive him now as your Savior. And you can be forgiven of your sins and saved for all eternity. Please accept this free gift God gives. You and I are loved by the God of the universe. Let's move on and consider how Leo responded to being hated. I'm going to read verse 31 again, along with verses 32 through 34. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again, and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. 
And she conceived again, and bare a son, and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. God saw that Leah was hated, so he enabled her to conceive children. And I love this example of the Lord's compassion and care. You know, he sees the big and small things each of us suffer, and he tenderly cares for us. In Leah's case, she started having children, which was extremely important in her day and culture. But as for how she responded to being hated, I think we get a picture of a woman desperate to be loved. Leah knew she was hated. She felt it to the core of her being, and she desperately longed for her husband's love. I think this is so tragic and and heartbreaking because no marriage should be like this. And ladies, if you have a husband who loves you, I think it would be a great application to just take a moment sometime today and thank him for his love for you. And if you are a wife who feels you're in a place like Leah found herself and you're unloved and you know that and you and you feel this strong intense dislike from your husband even maybe sometimes sensing a hatred from him that that's even hard to say because I cannot imagine it but but if that describes you and your marriage I am so sorry and I I want to encourage you to take your broken heart to the Lord Jesus Christ he is the only one who can fully satisfy the longings of our heart he is the only one who can completely love us and yet I understand um, in the best way that I can that you are hurting deeply and so God is the one who holds the answers to your situation I don't know what his exact plan looks like for you but turn to him look into his word and he will guide and direct you according to his will okay well back to Leah I want us to listen again to her thoughts after she gave birth to her firstborn son she said surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction now therefore my husband will love me And after she gave birth to her second son, she said, Because the Lord hath heard I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. Even after delivering her third son, Leah said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. It is evident Leah was desperate to be loved. She knew she didn't measure up in Jacob's eyes. She wasn't exactly what he wanted. So she thought giving him sons would be enough to gain his love. And again, let me stop here and apply this thought to our lives. I think innately we understand we are not good enough for God. So sometimes we try to do a lot of things to make ourselves good enough. And we just need to stop it because we already have God's love. Remember the verse I read in Romans 5. God shows us his love in Christ's death on the cross. He died for you and me because he loves us. You, there's, there is not a greater love than what Christ has for us. And I want to take this one step further. There is a difference between having God's love and having a relationship with him. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world He loves every man, woman, and child, yet he only has a right relationship with those who believe in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We aren't good enough on our own, and we can't do enough on our own to have a right relationship with God. That is why we need Jesus. 
Ephesians 1 6 tells us he made us accepted in the beloved let's stop trying to gain God's acceptance by what we do let's stop worrying about whether we're doing enough to please God thoughts like that are just rabbit trails that take us nowhere and I say that from experience I cannot tell you how many times I have just run in circles on those trails worrying fretting being anxious about am I doing enough for God oh my goodness that's not where God wants us to be when we place our faith in Christ as our Savior it's done it's final because we are accepted in the beloved it's not an acceptance based on what we do or don't do or all those things it is based on Christ praise the Lord thank you Jesus and and this should grow our gratitude for the Lord Jesus Christ he is everything that pleases God and he is everything we need so instead of worrying about whether we're good enough or doing enough for God let's focus on serving God out of love because of what Christ already has done for us okay let's get back to Leah she responded to being hated by feeling desperate for love yet she didn't stop there and I am so glad because here's what we need to see in Leah's desperation she turned to the Lord I kind of alluded to this thought in the application I made a moment ago but In Leah's situation, after she gave birth to her first and second sons, she acknowledged God's activity on her behalf. Now, I think it's important to notice that I don't think Leah was brought up by a father who believed in the one true God. Genesis 31.30 refers to Laban's mention of his gods and that was with a little g and then there's another verse where it mentions household idols so i don't think leah grew up in a home where the one true god was looked to solely and leah must have heard about god through jacob somehow and as a result she looked to the lord in her life and i love this Despite the sorrows Leah suffered, she turned to God. Her marriage was not the way she wanted, but she still recognized God's power and goodness to her. Let's take her example to heart. When we are hated or even just disliked, let's look to the Lord. When life is not matching up to our expectations, Let's still recognize God's goodness and power in our lives. It's always there. The Lord knows our needs, and He provides for us in such tender, personal ways. So we've seen how Leah was hated and desperate for love. And you might be feeling like, whoa, this is such a depressing story. I don't think I want to listen anymore. Well, I have some good news. I actually have something positive to share now about Leah's story. And it is this. Leah was chosen. And she was chosen in two specific ways. First, God chose Leah to be in the direct ancestral line of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Genesis 29, 35, which says, And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing. We learn in the New Testament book of Matthew that Jesus, the Son of God, descended from the line of Judah. And it was this Judah, the son of Jacob and Leah. The fact that Leah was hated makes this truth even sweeter. God chose Leah. He chose to distinguish her in the line of Christ. And there was another way Leah was chosen. Jacob chose to bury her in the cave of Machpelah 
alongside Abraham and Sarah, as well as Isaac and Rebecca. You see, Rachel had died in childbirth after delivering her second son, Benjamin, so she was buried on the way to Bethlehem. But Leah died later, and her final resting place was in the cave of Machpelah, where her husband Jacob was also eventually buried. And I see this as an honor to Leah, who suffered greatly in her life, but also bears distinction as one who was chosen. And for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, God has chosen us too. I want you to just listen as I read Colossians 3 verses 12 through 13. I love these verses. And they they say, And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. God has chosen you, my friend. Hold on to that truth when you feel the rejection or even the hatred of others. Recognize your desperate need for Christ and turn to Him when you're hurting. Appreciate God's blessings, whatever they may be, and accept His plan for your life. As I said, Leah's life was not what she wanted, but God still had a good plan. He still gave her children. He still, you know, brought the, the Lord Jesus Christ through her line. What a beautiful blessing for Leah. And Leah definitely experienced heartache. And, and I want to, to just express maybe you are experiencing your own heartache today. Remember, God sees you and loves you deeply. He will help you through this situation, whatever it may be. And he'll be glorified in the process because he uses the tough things in our lives to make us more like Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for teaching us truth for our lives through the life of Leah. I thank you for your love for her and the way you used her in a very mighty way. God, I pray for each listener that she would be aware of your presence in her life and have a deeper understanding of your work in her heart and in the situations she faces right now. Give her peace and give her joy. I pray this now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for taking time to learn more from God's word with me. And I trust the Lord will use this message to meet you where you're at. I also want to invite you to join me on November 22nd for episode three of the Indestructible Life podcast. And one final thing, please check out the show notes for today's podcast at proclaiminghimtowomen.com. These notes contain links to a couple of blog posts I wrote about being good enough and doing enough for God. And since we considered those topics in today's message, I really think you can be encouraged by what I have written in those posts. Okay, that is about it. Until next time, this is Emily Wickham. Hey, if you've enjoyed this podcast and want to help others discover it, please share it with your friends and leave a review. You can also follow this podcast or subscribe to my blog at ProclaimingHimToWomen.com so you never miss an episode. And remember, God loves you. In Christ, you're indestructible.